If you're listening to this on the podcast, this is episode 113. And if you're watching this on video, I have no idea what episode it is. We've done probably about 1,500 of these video interviews since 2019. So pick a number. I'm going to be talking to economist Aaron Cosby. He's a development economist with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. He's got 30 years of experience in the areas of uh, trade, investment, and sustainable development. And last week, his team at I IISD published a brief call uh, titled, Why Canada is Unlikely to Sell the Last Barrel of Oil. So welcome to the interview, Eric. Thanks, Markham. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm particularly interested in our interview because just yesterday, I interviewed economist Kent Fellows from the University of Calgary, who had released a brief arguing that, in fact, the oil sands, which makes up about 60, 70 percent of, Can of Canada's uh, oil production, have driven their costs down so low and will continue to deliver their costs, uh, drive their costs even lower and will probably be competitive long after 2050. I mean, it's really the counter argument to to your brief in a way. And so I'm very interested to see the analysis and argument uh, that uh, that you have to offer. So let's let's start out with uh, the four areas of focus in the brief. If you could explain those, please. Sure. The brief starts from the position that we're going to see a, a peak and decline in demand, global demand for oil. Peak coming around 2030, pick your number, and according to all the various analysts, and a decline thereafter that gets steeper and steeper as the end uses for oil disappear, including driven primarily by electric vehicles, but not only them. And it asks, what does that mean for Canadian producers? You know, and this is the this is the key point to which Kent Fellows devotes himself. Are we going to have a large part of that shrinking global market or a small part of that global market, right? Our argument is first that uh, our ESG credentials are not going to save us any market share in that global market because the large Midwest refiners that are buying our oil or increasingly those that we export to overseas don't care. They want quality, they want cost, they want product. Uh, and secondly, our cost performance is not going to save our markets because relative to Middle Eastern producers, we are not low cost, in fact, uh, and they have a huge number of reserves you know, on a global scale. Uh, I, we don't compete to them with them head to head, but we'll get to that those details in a moment. Anyway, we are not the lowest cost global producers by any means. Um, and finally, uh, that if we think about where prices are going to go in future, that OPEC discipline is going to be severely tested by an environment in which they've never existed before, where it, we're seeing a secular decline in demand. You're not weathering a boom and bust cycle waiting for better times. You're weathering a boom and bust cycle knowing that it's going to get worse in future. The discipline of individual members under those conditions is going to be so tested, they'll, they will produce now, driving the prices down, not good for Canadian producer, either on prices or on demand market share. Okay, let's go through the argument because uh, I this is an important point. Uh, there are still, and I run across all kinds of folks in the uh, North American oil patch, whether they're from Alberta or Texas or Saskatchewan or Newfoundland and Labrador, wherever they are, who still think that this is not a structural uh, change in global oil markets. They think this is just another example of boom and bust and structural change, if it comes, literally, that's the their argument, if it comes, will be like 2050, 2075. And what, what, how would you respond to that? Look, the major source of oil demand is road transport at 44%. We are seeing a, an uptick in the in, in an S curve adoption of uh, electric vehicles for passenger transport uh, to the point where I think we, China, the biggest, the biggest market for those products last year doubled the new share of electric vehicles to 26%. That's a doubling in a year. Those kinds of trends, that's not a transitory phenomenon. Those kinds of trends you're seeing worldwide. We are going to see a, a huge bite into the biggest source of demand for oil that is never going to come back. That is a structural change, right? And it, that is not an isolated incident. The oil that's now used for heating 
uh, residential and commercial, and for power generation is already walking dead. There are cheaper solutions. The oil that's used in uh, other forms of transport, long distance, commercial, aviation, maritime shipping, also face huge threats because of new technologies and global climate policies. And the oil that's used in petrochemicals to, pr to produce plastics is going to be subject to a whole raft of legislation that tries to reduce plastic pollution and alternatives to plastic. That one is probably more durable, but if you add all that up, we're looking at a reduction in demand for oil post-2030 that falls off a cliff, starts to go down quickly, and will never recover. Now, that if that's not a structural change, I don't know what is. Yeah, th there's a very interesting aspect to the, uh, to the electric vehicle revolution that we don't talk about very much. And we used to call it rights law, and now we call it learning curves. But I think back in the 30s, uh, the uh, I forget the, the fellow's first name. He's an engineer uh, in the uh, aeros in the uh, airplane manufacturing industry, and he noted that every time you doubled the production of a particular airplane, the costs fell by a predictable amount five percent, ten percent. It depends on on the industry, and what that means for uh, clean energy uh, technologies like electric vehicles, wind, solar, batteries, and so on is that as they scale up, as we use more of them and buy more of them, we can expect those learning curves to kick in and the cost will, will continue to come down. So we've already seen in the last 10, 11, 12 years, the learning the cost curves for battery, uh, for wind and solar and even batteries come down very steeply, like a factor of factor of 10. And, and Wright's law tells us that that's going to continue. We'll we'll, we'll yep. see you know a five or ten percent whatever it is reduction in the cost of an electric vehicle uh, every time pr production uh, doubles, and and I think that the nature of of uh, an electric car versus a, a car that runs on a commodity like oil turned into gasoline and diesel is fundamentally different, and a lot of folks just haven't caught up to that difference yet. That's right. Uh, so there's there's that dynamic. There's the learning by doing dynamic that's going to bring prices down. There's also the consumer uptake dynamic, you know, and uh, we quote a figure in the paper that McKinsey in 1980 was asked by AT&T how many cell phones there would be by the year 2000. They predicted 900,000 uh, and it was, uh, it was, it was a hundred million. <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we're, and that they fundamentally misjudge the, the, the speed at which consumers will uptake uh, a product, which they perceive, start to perceive as better, which other people are taking up, right? Where the costs are coming down, that's part of it. Uh, and, you know, where they, they fundamentally have a, a better product and you do in, in electric vehicles, a better product and it's it cheaper overall. So as we see increased model choice, as we see costs decreasing, as we see the, the consumer consciousness barriers dropping, as we see charging infrastructure rolling out, yeah, that's going to be a, a, a fun, such a, a swift uptake in those things that it, it really is going to upend the, the market for global demand for oil. Yeah. Now, what about the shape of the decline curve? I remember interviewing uh, a Wood McKenzie in, uh, economist in 2017 about a report and he said, look, we, we think that oil will, even back then, they were, they were predicting uh, peak demand for oil around 2030. And they have a lot of oil oil company uh, clients. And, and he said, our clients want to know what will be the shape of the decline curve. That, would, that was really key. And I just interviewed uh, Bloomberg, NEF's head of oil analysis, and they think that aviation will continue, uh, consumption will continue to climb. Plastics, petrochemicals, uh, consumption will continue to climb after 2030, partially offsetting the decline from uh, from road transport. And by, oh, 2050, the, there will still be 36 million barrels of oil uh, being consumed in the transportation sector. But it sounds like you wouldn't agree with that. No, if you look at this, if you look at, let's take a look at aviation. You already have uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway that have outlawed um, uh, short hop flights within their territory based on uh, kerosene, jet, diesel, right? Because the, because the technology in short haul aviation is such that you, it is now feasible to do electric flights. So in short haul, 
we have the technology, it's rolling off the shelf and global climate policies are going to push that market away. In long haul technology, the advances in sustainable aviation fuel are going to make that the same story, just, you know, delay by another five years or so, right? So in aviation, I, I don't see that. I don't see the a continuing market for, for kerosene. Uh, in long haul transport, again, it's a, it's a longer game story because you have to make such big investments in highway uh, charging systems. But short haul commercial vehicles, that, it's already more feasible to be using electric. It's a lower cost proposition for a, a sector which is concerned about lifetime costs of operation. You know, even more so than your average consumer is because they, they do those figures, right? So that market is gone as well. Plastics, yes, it's the most durable sector of oil demand out there. Um, if we assume that with rising GDP in developing countries like China, India, they will consume plastics at the same rate we do now eventually, yes, then it's a booming market. And you have to make those kinds of assumptions. But I think they're unrealistic assumptions. We see China and India actively participating in international negotiations to, uh, to limit the use of plastics. Not because they want to limit oil, but because they, their, you know, their rivers, their lakes, their uh, environments are being clogged by single-use plastic and unreusable plastic. Um, so this is not a this is not a developed world problem. This is a developing world problem as well, and we will not see the same kind of uptake in plastic in those countries uh, as we've seen in developed countries. That's just a fundamental misconception. Every forecaster that that uh, that you uh, quote in your brief, I've interviewed many of them, and the the the, the, the X variable uh, that they make very clear in their assumptions is climate policy. It's government policy. Policy can shift that curve uh, significantly by 2050. And we keep seeing over and over again, whether it's the COP15 biodiversity uh, that just wrapped up, if it's COP, the COP26, COP27, there are all sorts of uh, strengthening climate policies on the global front that would support your, your argument. Now, let's talk about falling oil prices, because uh, I find this uh, really interesting. I came across an IHS market blog from last year that arg uh, this is f the uh, average price, uh, sorry, the average break even uh, up to 2040 is for about like 90% of, of current production is below $50 a barrel. And 44% of that is well below $40 a barrel. So when Kent argues that, you know, the oil sands have become a low cost barrel, well, so have a lot of other barrels. And there's a big trend in oil and gas that doesn't get remarked upon outside of the oil and gas industry, and that's digitalization. The adoption of artificial intelligence, machine learning, cameras, sensors, analytics, they're using that to replace labor so that they bring down their labor costs they bring down, they increase their productivity. So they, again, bring down their, their production costs. And that trend is only about five, six years old in, in oil and gas. It's got a long, long runway uh, to continue. And it, it's unrealistic to expect that while the oil sands bring down their costs, that other producing nations aren't going to be doing the same thing. Right. Well, I mean, you, you could argue that uh, most of those trends uh, have, have been particularly salient in the mining industry. And so, you know, part of our oil sands production is in, in effect a mining uh, occupation. Right, and that that is where you're seeing the rollout of those kinds of technologies to bring down prices most astonishingly. So it's true, We're, we, we, are, uh, we are dropping our costs. If you look over the last 20 years, the uh, oil sands producers have dropped their costs considerably. Uh, but your point stands, so have other producers. But, but I think the more interesting question is, what does that mean? So we have dropped our costs. We are able to weather low cost and volatile cost, uh, low price and volatile price futures. But what does that mean for Canadian producers overall? Is that going to be a nice future? Or are we going to be hunkering down in a storm that we know is not going to get any better? It's going to get worse. And what are the characteristics of that hunkering down? That's where I'd like to drill. And that, you know, that's the rebuttal to the, the Kent Fellows argument. We can, look, we can weather low prices. We can weather volatile prices. But will there be any investment in new capacity? No. Will there be expansion, incremental expansion of existing capacity? Maybe. What does that mean for jobs in the sector? Because you're eliminating the whole services sector, which is fundamentally predicated on growth in the sector. What does it mean for royalties that are going to be remitted? You know, th these, these are the characteristics of that future, and they're not good. Sure, our producers can carry on producing, fine. 
but what does that mean about their contribution to, you know, it, they're going to be fine, but are, are the oil dependent governments, communities, workers that we currently have going to be fine? Not so much so. I, I want to bring some data into this discussion about workers because uh, I went and checked the the data, the employment data in the various sectors and across various provinces. And the industry itself has lost over 40,000 jobs, right. uh, Canada wide, since about 2013, 2014. Yep. And it's very interesting where those jobs were lost. Most of them were in Alberta, and almost all of them were in the services sector. So that and that sector yep. largely ser uh, uh, serves the conventional production, which is the, uh, in my opinion, is uh, far and away the highest cost marginal barrel in in Western Canada. Well, in Canada, as yep. as a rule, and so. If there, if prices go down, that's the sector that it produces about a million, 1.2 million barrels a day across the country, about five, 600,000 barrels a day in, in Alberta, three, 400,000 in, in Saskatchewan. That's the one that'll go first. And then that will yep. have all those service sector jobs uh, will be the most vulnerable and they're in small communities. They're out in Devon and Wainwright yep. and, yep. you know, Estevan and Weyburn, places like that. They're going to be hit the hardest. That's right. It's important to understand that when Kent Fellows talks about being low cost producers, he's talking about oil sands producers. That's about two thirds of our production, but we still have another third of our production in conventional oil. And that's subject to all of the stuff you just said. Even among those low, low cost producers in the oil sands, he's talking about mature legacy producers that have paid off their capital investment. So even, you know, you're shrinking it even more. Those guys are going to be fine. But the rest of the sector is going to go through a not very rosy future. The marginal producers are not going to make it. And those are largely conventional producers, as you say. And the employment implications, as you say, over the last, you know, since 2014, 45,000 jobs lost. And we can project that going off into the future. We know that in low-cost environments, this sector sheds jobs as it looks for efficiency. Efficiency is good, but not if you're a worker, right? Exactly right. And I, I, you, you're, in your brief, you talk about OPEC's response to declining demand. So demand destruction within the global oil market. And there's there's a theory out there. I think I, I first ran across it from Spencer Dale, the economist for the for BP. And basically, there will come up an inflection point on that decline curve where the low cost producers like Saudi Arabia say, you know what? It's better in our interest, instead of cutting back production to maintain prices, which is as a swing producer, that's what they've been doing. Instead, we're going to flood the market and we're going to drive the shale producers. We're going to drive the high cost producers out of the market and we're going to take that market share. And that's how we're you know, going to maximize our revenue, which seems like a perfectly rational uh, you know, uh, decision on their part. But when might that happen? What's your take on that? Well, I mean, my take, if, if you look at what happened in 2014, that's more or less what they tried to do, right? They tried to drive the U.S. shale producers out and it sort of failed spectacularly for the whole sector. So, you know, if I'm thinking about the breakdown and discipline in OPEC uh, as it comes in this low declining demand future, it's probably not going to be Saudi Arabia that's the, that's the problem you're probably going to see uh, some of the other swing producers, the individual smaller member states who have huge pressing economic needs, who have national oil companies that are not operated strictly on economic criteria, they're, just, they're mandated to produce jobs, or you're gonna have rogue states like Russia that need, <laughs> need the capital because they've been isolated internationally. That's gonna be your problem. You're gonna have a breakdown in the discipline of the members. OPEC is not this homogeneous uh, entity. It's a bunch of different members and there's always been tension. Those tensions will be ratcheted up to an unprecedented level as you face a, a future in which your reserves are going to be worth less 10 years from now than they are now. There's going to be ups and downs, but you know that the stuff that you're putting, pulling out of the ground is going to be worth more if you pull it out now than it is 10 years from now. And so the incentives are going to be more magnified than ever to pull it out now. Let's let's talk about the Canadian oil producers, environmental, social, and governance shielding them from some of that uh, uh, price volatility, so ESG. And you argue that ESG won't protect them, but I might add that, in fact, it might be their Achilles heel because a lot of the Canadian oil is very high emissions, uh, has a high emissions intensity, and and in, as soon as carbon gets priced down in the, in the U.S. in some way, uh, they're going to have a big problem. 
if the U.S. does in some way price carbon in a way that affects imports of Canadian oil, I agree with you. Uh, and they could do that through a fuel standard, a national fuel standard, similar to our clean fuel standard. I think that's unlikely. I don't think that you will see, in, in, you look at the U.S. politics around oil prices, right? <laughs> I don't think you're going to see a national, uh, a federal government, an administration in the U.S. that proposes to raise oil prices for consumers in that way. Um, so I, I, my argument is our ESG credentials aren't going to save us and our GHG intensity isn't going to sink us. As regards our export markets in the States, we have mid Midwest U.S. refiners that are set up, have done multi-billion dollar investments trying, you know, in, in processing Canadian heavy crude. And that's what they want. They don't want an interruption in that supply. They're a captive market, right? They don't care if we, you know, produced it ethically. They don't care if we produced it in a, a GHG intense or unintense manner. They don't care about that stuff. And I don't see, I don't see that changing. Uh, so this for me is a non-issue in terms of our market share. Don't get me wrong. It's an important issue in terms of investment in this sector because investors are running away from high uh, GHG intensity uh, activities. And so it's harder and harder to get investment in new capacity and it's harder to get social license for pipelines. So it's important in that sense, but it is not going to save our market share going forward because the people that are buying our oil just don't care. Right. And I think it's important to point out, and I pointed this out in the, in the Kent interview, that many of the people buying our oil are us. I mean, Canadian producers like Suncor and Sonovas have refineries down in the U.S. that have been kitted out for heavy oil, and they they essentially sell the oil to themselves. And so yeah. that's a market that will presumably uh, that you know will survive uh, even while other demand falls away. That's right. You know, and and if if you take it out to it, you know, at the at the level of other commodities, it's it is important how the thing was produced. Right. If you're thinking about organic food, if you're thinking about, uh, um, you know, uh, fair trade chocolate, those kinds of things, people will pay a premium for that. There's nobody going to pay a premium at the pump for Canadian oil that was produced ethically. That's not going to happen, partly because logistically it's impossible to, to actually say that this gallon of uh, uh, petrol was actually produced ethically, you know, not to separate it because that, that's just not the way the supply chains work. But partly because people don't do that. You already have an option to pay more at the pump for premium fuel. Right? How many people do that? It's, it, cost matters at the pump. Well, what what's your take on the uh, the peak of gasoline and diesel consumption in the United States? That's the big. That's the only market that Canadian oil producers have at the moment, uh, at least the oil sands for sure. Will we see, uh, <clears throat> thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act and state emphasis on electrifying transportation? Are we going to see a fairly rapid decline in in demand in the U.S. market? Well, the, the forecasts for the demand destruction that's part of the IRA are for like 2.1 million barrels per day uh, of, of demand that just disappears as a result of the, the various pieces of uh, regulation in the IRA. That's a big chunk. You know, if you compare that to Canadian exports to the states of 3.1 uh, million barrels per day or around 3 million barrels per day. That's a big chunk, right? So the question is, what does that mean for, and, and sorry, the, 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 those estimates on the IRA don't yet include the recently announced, uh, zero emission vehicle mandate from California or the 15 other States that are probably going to follow California in that. So they don't include a huge chunk of emissions, of uh, demand destruction that's going to happen because of that. So we're going to see demand destruction in the U S what does that mean for Canadian producers? We're selling to some very low cost, efficient refiners in the Midwest. So they are probably not going to be the first to shut down. They'll probably be the last to shut down. There will be continuing demand for our product from those refiners who have to basically don't have alternatives to, to uh, heavy uh, crude. So we're going to have, in that sense, a buffer against the, the, the tide of demand destruction because we have that guaranteed uh, demand, but it's not and in debt, it's not a completely infallible buffer and it won't last forever because oil is ultimately in the long run, it's fungible. It can move around. There are global ties, even, even that will affect the Midwest producers that are landlocked. So we're going to see, we're going to see huge pressures on those refiners. Uh, and even if 
even if we manage to preserve, preserve market share, selling to those refiners, and that's going to be difficult, we are still going to be subject to the problem of decreasing price because of global demand. Those prices are set globally. U.S. producers are not uh, price makers. So, you know, we face two problems, falling demand, and to some extent, we're buffered by our existing uh, lines of supply to the U.S. refiners on that. But falling price, we're not sheltered by, by anybody. In fact, we're, we're quite exposed. We're increasingly exposed. We're selling 300 million barrels a day out of the out of the Gulf that are exported. We we may be selling another 600 million barrels a day out of the TMX. That's about a quarter of our uh, total production right now. We're increasingly subjecting ourselves to a non-buffered uh, export supply that will be feeling both price and demand decline. So. My, my bottom line take, we're buffered by the fact that we've got these customers in the States, but that's not a buffer that's going to last forever. Just for a clarification, I think you mentioned, you you said 300 million barrels a day and 600 million barrels a day, and I think you meant 3 million and 6 million. I'm sorry. That's right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that back in. Yeah. <laughs> not a problem. I, I, I want to talk about uh, how sorry, the so oil... 300,000 and 600,000. Uh, so 600,000 of export out of the TMX, 300,000 exported out of the Gulf states, not processed, just exported. You know, Primarily, those will go to Chinese consumers. So almost a million barrels a day. One of the assumptions that the uh, the pro oil sands, the pro Canadian oil and gas folks make, is that in that twenty five million barrel a day scenario, by say by twenty fifty, is that all of the other the producers of the seventy five million barrels a day that was displaced are all going to go away. They're going to stop producing. It's not economic. And given the fact that you know, so many of them, are, as you pointed out, are, are national oil companies. They need they need revenue to to run their governments, their social programs, and that sort of thing. It seems to me that there's going to be a lot more supply chasing demand as demand falls. That it won't work in a, some classic market sense. And can you address that from kind of a theoretical point of view? And you know, the rational behavior within a market point of view? Sure. I mean, if you look at, let, let's look at the cost structures of Saudi producers uh, or producers in the United Arab Emirates. We are low cost in Canada, yes. They are much lower cost, half of our costs. Uh, and they, they could cover that entire 25 million barrels themselves. Not the same oil we're supplying. It's sweet, it's light, which is actually better oil. Uh, but if we're if we're really talking about a scenario in which there's 25 million barrels a day sold globally, the idea that we could be part of that market and and it wouldn't all be taken up by much lower cost Middle Eastern producers uh, is daydreams. I, you know, I, it it may be that we maintain some of it because of our close ties to the states and because of the transport realities and the the sunk costs and investment in those refineries in the states. But to the idea that we could thrive in a market of 25 million barrels going head to head against uh, Middle Eastern producers that have half our costs, I don't care how costs are, how low our costs go, we're not going to undercut the Saudis, right, is, is fiction. I want to wrap up our conversation with a point that you make in the brief, which is that Canada should be exploring uh, new uses or alternate, you you talk about alter, uh, other sectors of the economy, growing, say, the clean energy economy to replace the capital investment and the jobs and the business opportunities that would that are going to disappear as the oil and gas sector declines. Now, I want to discuss this because I've argued uh, many times in columns and, and other places that, in fact, what Canada should be doing is looking at transitioning from feedstock, it's oil from feedstock uh, for fuels to feedstock for materials, like turning bitumen into carbon fiber or activated carbon or asphalt binder for roads, that sort of thing. That's actually a, a potentially a, hot, a much higher value use, creates more value, more jobs in the economy. And the problem uh, though, is that to do that, we need to start yesterday. There's no time to waste here because, you know, processes have to be invented, plant has to be built, markets have to be developed. This doesn't happen overnight. You know, we need sure. a, a decade or two. Sure. What's, what's your take on that? Well, you know, vehement agreement. Uh, if you look at the, all of those things you talked about are things that are being explored by Alberta, uh, Alberta Innovates. The idea that they've looked at what the potential size of a, a, a market for carbon fiber could be. And, and we have an advantage 
in that the, the types of uh, bitumen that we bring out of the ground are, are ideal for producing carbon fiber in the, in the way that they've looked at and also asphaltine. So those are huge markets that we could capture and much bigger markets than we currently capture by exporting our oil to be burned in cars to contribute to climate change. Uh, but yes, you, that, that kind of the development of those markets, the development of those technologies, the bringing down a cost, we're talking a, a decades long proposition. You know, it took 20 years for the investment in the uh, in um, oil sands to pay off in Alberta to the point where they were commercially exploitable and generating a huge amount of wealth for the province. We're looking at a similar trajectory here. So you're right. <laughs> Yesterday, last, last year, last decade, uh, sink enough money into this stuff on a similar basis to the kind of big industrial policy effort we use to get the oil sands up and running to generate our, our prosperity in the future. You know, maybe that's carbon fiber, but it has to start now. I actually have one more point that, and maybe we'll wrap up the interview with this, uh, Aaron, but it seems like much of the policy in Canada around uh, oil, and, and I think you could say this about gas as well, and particularly in Alberta, which is the epicenter of the oil and gas industry, and at the federal government, doesn't matter which government, which party is in government, is very reactive. We we don't ever sit down and and you know as a as an industry and get governments in the at the same table and look out and say, okay, here's what we can expect, or here are scenarios. 2030, 2040, 2050, 2060. Here's how we can apply new models of policy, industrial policy you mentioned. That's a big one. And 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 let's put in place a vision and a strategy. And then the policies needed to achieve that strategy. And we'll get and we'll get uh, you know the private sector on on board. And instead, all we do is basically put band-aids on the status quo until the status quo changes enough that we have to do something else. It seems like a very irrational approach to policy and industrial uh, development, industrial policy uh, here and, you know, between the, within Canada generally. It's one that's ignorant of the lessons of the past. I mean, the, the current prosperity of Alberta was built on that kind of visionary effort by Peter Lougheed, who against the wishes of the uh, incumbent oil producers at the time, decided that oil sands were the way to go in the future decided that his long-term vision was a prosperity built on that massive reserves of, of oil sand sitting in Alberta and finding a way to make Alberta a low-cost producer of that oil, right? And that worked. That, that was a, it was a huge push at the time. It was a $4 billion investment in, in trying to figure out how to make that work and look at the results. Right. So you're right. That kind of I, I have I'm struggling to think of a, an example since then where where we have had that kind of visionary push uh, that that gets us where we need to go in future. But first thinks about what, what that looks like. And we certainly need it today if if <laughs> if ever we need it today. Well, Aaron, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insight. Thanks, Markham. A pleasure as always.